Welcome back to Keys. I hope you're all having a great start of 2023. And as usual, when a year starts, it's time for reflection, time for resolutions, as we all look at the year ahead and we think whether we are ready or not. So many of us this year may be feeling a little bit uneasy as uh, we have this poly crisis going on with the soaring cost of living around the world. We have a war in Europe. But we're going to take the time today to reflect together on what we've learned and how we can be better prepared. We will start as usual with Simon and his update on the public mood around the world. Then Luda in Washington DC will talk about risk and resilience and how we can anticipate changes and disruptions to help organize response with an on the ground update from Ukraine. After that, Carl in London and Priscilla in Sao Paulo will remind us that reputation matters, looking at the trend in trust ratings for sectors and industries around the world with a special focus on Brazil. And finally, with Welcome to the Metaverse, we will dive into a new dimension that will most likely change the way we do things in our everyday lives. That will be with Caitlin in Minneapolis. There will be uh, time for a short Q&A at the end of the session, so please don't hesitate to tap your questions, type your questions, sorry, into the chat box, and Simon will be looking at that and asking our presenters uh, your questions uh, at the end of the session. And with that, I will now hand over to Simon to kick off. Jennifer, thank you. Happy New Year to everyone on the call. It's great to uh, have you with us. And yes, for today's review of public opinion, I'm trying to be looking back, looking forward, as befits uh, the start of a new year. Now, if I look back over 2022, perhaps the, the headline finding uh, for many of us will be the return, at least in some markets, of inflation to centre stage. And uh, of course, we uh, as a research company have been doing many reports and analysis on this topic, and I'm sure you have in your own uh, organisations. Worth bearing in mind, though, that this wasn't a sudden uh, thing. It was already the case uh, by before even 2022 had started. If we go back 13 months to December 2021 at, at this webinar, we were already flagging uh, that inflation was rising. We were starting to do new surveys to try to understand the dynamics of this. And we were observing uh, already that inflation was rising up uh, the list when it comes to what are the big worries uh, facing uh, your country. So what we saw through 2022, of course, was bit by bit, month by month, that figure rising. So we went from 20% in January uh, 2022 to 40% mentioning inflation by the end of the year. And it were, those were numbers which changed and which rose in almost every country uh, we've been uh, interviewing in. Now, of course, one of the other stories uh, of the last year or so, as Jennifer mentioned, is the poly crisis, all of the different uh, issues and topics and themes coming together at once, including things that have been with us uh, in the background all for all of our uh, all of the years, uh, crime and violence, unemployment, corruption, poverty, joined, of course, in 2020 by coronavirus. This two year sweep charts the fall of COVID, which really accelerated during uh, the 12 months of, of 2022, as measured in our What Worries the World study. And what we saw was that it was replaced by this rise in concern about in inflation that I was just mentioning. Big question now as we look forward is, has inflation peaked as a worry? We've, we've now had three months now where it's either been stable or just falling away slightly. So it's a big topic we will, of course, be coming back to in these webinars. And as we look forward, um, always good to take stock of how people are feeling themselves on the ground as they live their lives about the year just gone and the year ahead. And we've tried to do that again in this prediction survey uh, that we do every year. 36 countries uh, asking people around the world for their take on things. Their take for 73% of them anyway uh, is that 2022 was a, a bad year uh, for my country. And uh, I'm talking you, to you today. Uh, from from Britain, from London. Uh, we are one of the 
grumpiest or, or gloomiest uh, countries uh, in the world uh, on this measure. Um, if you think about the historic context, uh, one, one of the particular things to uh, observe is that um, this figure is still at a higher level than it was uh, before the COVID crisis. So, so if you're asking people about what, the, what things were like for your country, uh, it's certainly uh, getting a more negative view uh, than we were before COVID hit. But in terms of my family and my daily life, perhaps we're returning uh, to something that's a bit more like normal when we're asking people to reflect on the last 12 months. But what about the year ahead? Jennifer was reflecting on New Year and perhaps new optimism. Can we see much optimism in our 2023 predictions survey? Well, not that much, if I'm to be frank. Um, if you look at the outlook for 2023, it's the worst uh, that we've seen on these two measures for the 10 years that we've been collecting uh, this uh, information. So uh, plenty, I think, of scope for us to be, uh, if not pessimistic, uh, realistic, perhaps, about the, the overarching mood. If I wanted to be uh, a little bit more positive in my, in my mindset, I might focus on this figure. Uh, the two and three are still optimistic for all of the problems and all of the challenges we face still uh, feeling uh, favourable about uh, the, the year ahead. But uh, we do, I think, have to acknowledge that there are some very real causes of concern for people uh, in the world uh, today as we look ahead to the coming period. This one, uh, I think, illustrates the uh, concerns on the economy. 79% of people saying that prices in my country will rise more quickly than incomes. Maybe concerns about inflation have peaked, but that maybe that's not quite uh, the point. Uh, but people seeing real pressure on their spending power. This is a, a, a number which is repeated in countries all around the world. Real consistency uh, in this sense, perhaps, that my income isn't going to keep pace with price rises. Second issue, of course, is around uh, security uh, around the world. And, uh, Luda will take us through what's happening on the ground in Ukraine shortly, but uh, just to say that 48% of people around the world are telling us that nuclear weapons may be used in a conflict somewhere in the world this year. It's up 14 points on uh, last year and it, it really you know, is, is a particular flag as we look uh, at the issues of concern that we all face. And talking of which, we have, of course, the climate and all of those weather events that we experienced over the last year. 57% are saying that it's going to be the hottest year on record in my country. And when we look at that 57% by different countries and look towards the, the top of the chart at the countries which are most sure uh, that we're going to have the hottest year on record, I can find countries in Europe, in Asia, and in Latin America. So something uh, which now unites us all. But looking for some reasons to be cheerful, well, one uh, is this, uh, we hope. Certainly 60% of people out there are saying that they think there'll be no further lockdowns in my country this year. So uh, let's hope we can put uh, the COVID experience at least behind us. Um, and we've got 56% of people saying that many more people will be living their lives in virtual worlds this year. And that's a topic that Caitlin is going to pick up on uh, and help us um, uh, think through whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. So I hope there's some material there for you perhaps to pause and take stock and perhaps dive into the results for your country. Uh, I leave you with the links which will be shared with you later. We at Ipsos have been also pausing to take stock and we tried to do that in our, in our almanac where we've done a month by month review of the events of the last 12 months and tried to bring analysis from different countries uh, to the fore to help us think through the different contexts and the different challenges uh, that we're facing uh, wherever we live. So that's really uh, our starting point. Uh, are we ready? Well, I think perhaps people are ready, but they're cautious and there are one or two worries uh, as we look ahead to, to the coming year. But I'll, I'll hand back to Jennifer for the moment. Thank you very much, Simon, for putting uh, all, all this into context. And now we're going to dive into a very specific topic with Luda. Uh, Luda, we're all curious to hear how we are monitoring changes and disruptions. And uh, so I'm going to pass over to you. 
Thank you, uh, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, everybody, uh, for having the opportunity to to talk to to you all today. Um, so my presentation will be. Give me one second. Yep, my presentation um, is about what Ipsos is doing in Ukraine. So we we all see the media reports about the war in Ukraine and how people um, people in Ukraine are resilient. And here is the view from our research and what kind what kind of research our team is using to understand the developments on the ground. So one of the one of the things that usually happens in the disaster or war zone, it's very difficult to collect the data. So what our team is doing, we um, we use different methods of data collection. So and the methods we're using is sometimes um, sometimes used by by scientists, sometimes by military. So we are using not only surveys but also satellite imagery, we're doing um, anonymized cell phone data to see um, the movements of the population of refugees potentially. And in order to do that, we bring a multidisciplinary teams that are working with us on this project, as well as our field teams. For example, a lot of our work we cannot do without our team in Ukraine. And as a rule, we work with, uh, for um, international organizations who would like to find out the specific situation on the ground in a particular city, whether it's a flood in Pakistan, whether it's a particular um, destruction in a particular city during the wartime. So that's a, the, it's mostly international organizations and bilateral organizations that we're working with on this kind of projects. One of the met methods of data collection that we're using is um, is uh, uh, it's satellite imagery of night light uh, of the Earth, and this is the image you see the image of uh, night lights of the city of Kherson, the southern city of um, in Ukraine that was under occupation on the Russian occupation for nine months. And why, while on its own, it might be not as interesting in telling, but when you combine it with other data sources, this is a great um, this is a great estimate of economic activity in the city, especially if you look before war and pre-war. And I have the image, the same data, um, but trended for 12, almost 12 months. It's the same night light analysis of Kherson, but put on the graph. So you can see that basically at the beginning of the war, 100% of the city has night light, and then and then it fluctuates throughout the year, depending on the events. We know some events that happened in October when Russian forces were pulling out and evacuating people. And then here is the flat line, zero electricity. As the Russian troops retreated, they exploded all the um, electric subst electricity substations. So the city was without electricity for some time. And this is kind of uh, research that is very telling if you're trying to estimate something from uh, remote location, you cannot get to the city, and this is one of the examples that um, I wanted to show. The other example is something that can be used for um, monitoring the refugee crisis or uh, human mobility. This is an example of uh, human mobility data. And basically here on the right side, of, right side of the slide, you see the territory of Ukraine that was annexed by, uh, by Russian Federation in 2014 called Donbass. And we were tracking a specific point where people cross uh, between the line, be between the war line. And where do those people go? So this is a heat map, basically, where people are going from this occupied territory. And the reason we it would be interesting to know is again what where do the people go where do they look for services and where the ukrainian government or international organization can provide those services so that's another example of human mobility data that we use um, as remote um, type of data collection and now some um some insight into ukraine resilience monitor that we're doing and how ukrainians are doing during this war time so we're tracking a lot of different things. The most important things is we are tracking public opinion in Ukraine. We're also tracking the access to basic services um, and how Ukrainian people are handling the difficulties of living in the war zone or close to the war zone in east and south part of the country, as well as the capital that is constantly under attacks by the drones or by, by, by the Russian rockets. 
so just to remind everybody, here's the map of Ukraine. The war zone is basically coming in the east and then going all the way through um, above Crimea. And here we have a couple of cities, city of Mykolaiv that we did survey, city of Kherson that I just showed. And then we have city of Kharkiv, one the second largest city in, in Ukraine. And recently in the news, this is the city of uh, Dnipro. So what we found, we have a lot of data, of course, on um, uh, from Ukraine, but what we uh, what we are tracking is that the closer you to the front line, the more difficult economic and uh, basic services, um, access to basic services is. So half of the population of Kharkiv and Mykolaiv have no access to heat. We have a very um, critical situation in Mykolaiv where 30% of people only have access to water. And then after October 2022, we have um, really an emergency in Ukraine where um, the whole Ukraine um, does not have enough electricity due to bombardments of the, in the, uh, of the energy infrastructure where approximately 60% of the en energy infrastructure have been destroyed. We also see, of course, what comes with the war is um, decrease in employment and worsening economic situation. In the big city of Kharkiv, only two in five people are employed. And in the small cities that we surveyed that have been liber liberated in the east, east only one in four uh, people are employed. And this is this is just a graph to out, to highlight that Mykolaiv has very only few people in Mykolaiv, only one third of the population in Mykolaiv has water. And then um, here is the numbers about employment and really worsening economic situation. So only half of the population in Mykolaiv and a little more than half of population in Kharkiv have, have been employed in October. The interesting thing also what we're tracking is what Ukrainians uh, are thinking about the reconstructions and who do they trust to um, to plan their reconstruction, uh, the kind of reconstruction of the country. And this graph presents a very interesting information. For some of us, it was really surprising to see that, but on the other hand, it's not. So most of Ukrainians in most of these uh, cities um, they trust their local governments and national government. Here is Ukrainian government to plan the rebuilding, the reconstruction for the country. We also see the third, uh, the third largest category as international finance organizations who Ukrainians trust a lot. And about a third of the population in the cities trust international finance organizations, which is really interesting. And it highlights that Ukrainians are not only ready to fight for their country on their own, but also they trust their government institutions to do that. And the other thing that we're tracking is that thanks to the help of uh, European Union, and United States, there are funds in the cities, in Mykolaiv, Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, the city councils are getting emergency money to repair all the infrastructure that's been ruined or destroyed. So as soon as the bomb bombing is over, you see the crews going and uh, repairing the energy, the energy sites or water supply, and that's really sh and that really shows the resilience of Ukrainian people. Just a couple of pictures from um, from my native city of Kyiv, where power generators, candles, and solar lamps are in high demand right now because people have electricity only a few hours a day. This is a um, this is the set of pictures from one of the children's hospitals. It's a neonatal care care neonatal care on one of the hospitals where doctors have limited um, electricity supply and have to work without it. And then also, I just wanted to pause for a moment and um, kind of reflect on what the war in Ukraine, what we've seen war in Ukraine did to the global economy. We've all seen the disruption in the energy sector, especially in Europe. We've seen the agriculture being uh, the agriculture supply lines also destroyed. We've seen food processing industry that is very heavy in Ukraine having impact and steel production. The city of Mariupol, the destroyed city, city of Mariupol was a huge steel production site. And all these things that were happening in the last year in Ukraine, of course, it's a big distraction from governments, from um, different international organizations who cannot invest their resources in very important issues such as, as climate change or pay attention to disasters that happen, let's say, in Somalia, where there is a potential for a famine or the flood in Pakistan. So war in Ukraine has been, has been really a distraction for uh, many governments and international institutions. You can 
you can find more information on our website. And back to you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luda. Uh, very sobering, I must say, information, but also extremely interesting to see the way that we are collecting this kind of information to be able to give it to uh, to the institutions that need this information to, to be able to do their activity. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about these challenges of incorporating traditional and remote sensing research techniques uh, if there's anything more you can share about this very interesting way of doing research. Sure, thank you for the question. Um, so in the last year, we've done a lot of uh, damage assessment of Ukrainian cities. And for example, in the city of Kharkiv in the northeast and northeastern part of Ukraine, the largest, the second largest city. So we couldn't get the coverage, the satellite coverage for the whole city to see the damage. And what we did is we, um, we basically decided that drone is something that we can do and use the drone and take the imagery, imagery of the city that is not covered by satellite. So, and we sent our um, drone operator to Kharkiv and that was really a great addition to our analysis and it was great to have for data analysis and thanks so definitely a, a a use of technology in research that maybe you know not not everyone knows about and uh, thank you very much for sharing that that experience and uh, and those stories with us uh, and now we are going to move to another part of the world. You told us about trust, about what the Ukrainians are thinking about reconstruction, and we're going to hear more about trust in sectors and, uh, and industries uh, around the world from Carl and Priscilla. So over to you, Carl. Thank you. So when we start talking about trust and kind of like and and, and, a, and a poly crisis and normally this would be the point where most people would expect me to start talking about how trust is in crisis and the kind of and and, and, and consumer faith in the in the critical institutions and sectors that govern daily life um is is falling i mean and that's certainly the kind of the narrative that has um, dominated for much of the last decade However, Ipsos's perspective is that trust in most of the global institutions and sectors has been static for a very long time. And when, when change is happening, it's very slow and, ha and is actually fairly positive. Looking at some long term trends to begin with, this is data from Pew and Gallup in the US and shows trust and confidence, trust and confidence in US mass media and trust in government. The, it, 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 the data has been static, has, has been in slow decline since about 2001, with year-on-year -year changes very small. In Europe, um, trust in the press and trust in political parties are pretty much are pretty much flat over the last 20 years. And while trust in government has fluctuated, generally speaking, most years little has changed. Ipsos's own data from over the last four years shows that trust in most industry sectors that we're that we've measured and 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 in the government has been increasing slowly since since 2019. Te technology is the is the only outlier here, which fell sharply between 2019 and 2021, and has been flat since. Looking at all the sectors we measure, the important thing to notice is that in terms of trustworthiness, all the sectors are within 12 points of each other, from, ph from pharmaceuticals at the top on 34% down to social media at the bottom on 22%. The other critical thing to notice is that, is that six of these sectors are actually net negative, with more people, more people regarding them as untrustworthy than trustworthy. And this, I suspect, is where the historical opinion about trust being in crisis comes from. But just because people are just because trust in a, in a sector is, is negative doesn't necessarily mean it's getting worse. And in, in fact, for most of these, it's getting better. Looking at the top of the rankings for a second, uh, uh, technology and pharmaceuticals, you can see that you can see that technology fell from there from a high in 2019 and 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 has been has been stable since. But pharmaceuticals, who benefited hugely from consumer opinion over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. Has, has has really had a a a a majorly impressive upward um, um, uh, upward change, and is now the now the now the most trusted sector that we measure. 
before we go on, go on, global consumers say that reliability, transparency, and responsibility are the key things which determine trustworthiness. And it's performance on these three metrics, plus environmental sustainability, which tends to determine um, whether a sector or an institution is improving or falling away when it comes to trust. Looking at pharma and tech, both are performing very strongly on nearly all of the top four on nearly all of the all of the top four metrics. The issue the, the, the issue for, for technology is that they have that their over their overall trustworthiness rating has been artificially inflated for much of the la, of the last ten years because they've been the new and interesting sector. But that that has begun to tarnish over the last few years, and now what we're seeing is a kind of a, a bit of a a bit of a reset of how they're seen by the public back towards a more standard industry norm. Looking at the at the two least trusted trusted sectors, social media and government, both are still s slowly improving, even though they are both significantly net negative. But their untrustworthy ratings are falling, and their trustworthy scores are improving, albeit slowly. And this is because both of them are improving when it comes to things like being reliable, being open and transparent, behaving responsibly, and being environmentally sustainable. Social media has, uh, for social media, it's now some distance since their last major scandal. Um, and for governments across the world, uh, um, they're benefiting from their performances uh, in, uh, during the COVID pandemic, especially when it comes to the, ro to the rollout of vaccines. So what we're seeing globally is rather than rather than any kind of negative reaction to the poly crises that we are seeing, actually consumer faith in most of the big institutions um, and, and sectors that kind of under, underpin daily life is stable, improving for improving for many. And while people and, and, and while some are net negative, there is still there is still green that there there is still that there's still light at the end of the tunnel for them. So I'm now going to pass over to Priscilla in Brazil to give a deep to do to do a deep dive into what the data in that country shows. Okay, so here I go. Uh, my name is Priscilla and I'm showing you an overview of trust in, in Brazil. Well, to start, I brought some extra data about Brazil um, because this information is important uh, to understand the context of trust in the country. So one of the things that uh, I would like to say is that Brazil is a very rich country in many ways but especially regarding our diversity in terms of people and population. But also, for example, regarding our diversity in terms of environmental aspects. But sadly, we are also a very unequal country and maybe one of the most unequal countries in the world. So this complex um, frame and this big social inequality leaves its marks on social relationships as a whole, and of course in, uh, affects the level of trust among individuals and among individuals and institutions. So uh, what is the current picture of trust in Brazil? And here I have some just quick uh, fact uh, data. Uh, mm -hmm to show you what is the what is the uh, uh, big trust concerns in the country. So one of the things is that our uh, position in the interperson, interpersonal trust ranking is not so good. Actually, we are the last country out of 30 uh, in this particular measure. Only 11% of Brazilians say most people can be trusted and the global average for this index is 30%. Uh, the distrust levels in politicians, public ministers and public institutions as a whole is historically way below the global average. Uh, but despite this context of low trust levels in politicians and government especially, uh, these indicators are improving since 2019. 
following the global trend that Carl just showed to us. But when we think of trust in sectors specifically, we see uh, a slightly different picture. So mainly, contrary to the trust in government, trust levels towards uh, economic sector sectors are higher in Brazil and also in other countries in Latin America when compared to the global average. And here we can see that actually our trust levels in pharmaceutical company and technology companies are significantly higher when compared to the global average. But what is driving trust? So what is important to Brazilians when deciding whether to trust or not um, a sector? So the global monitor results confirm the importance of sustainability as a driver of trust in Brazil. If we look at the global ranking, um, this, this uh, sustainable factor is important, of course, but it's in the fifth place. And here in Brazil, it's in the top three most important drivers, along with being open and transparent, being reliable, and keeps its promises. So, uh, to sum up, um, what is important to know when doing business in Brazil? And to answer these questions, we need to talk about corporate leadership. So, I brought two information from the monitor uh, and com comparing to the global average as well. So, almost two thirds of Brazilians uh, agree to this statement that, that I expect companies to take a stand on issues that matters to me. And 54% of Brazilians agree to the sentence that says business leaders have a responsibility to speak out on social and political issues affecting my country. So the message is um, this, uh, the global trend indicates a new role for corporate leadership and we have been seeing this uh, for quite a while. But in countries with low trust in public institutions, such as Brazil, the demand for action can be even higher from corporations and also from business leaders. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Priscilla. And of course, you, you showed that picture at the beginning of your presentation, and I think all of us have in mind what we've been seeing and what we saw on the media a few days ago. And I, I wonder what the impact of the invasion of the parliament and, you know, what you went through in your country through the, in, in the last few days, how has that impacted trust? How are people, you know, what's the outlook now within the Brazilian population from what you see? Good, good question, interesting question. Uh, well, it's important to say that the data was collected uh, when we were having major elections in the country, so people were kind of excited with the, all this political context in a positive way, I believe. But the, uh, the impact on trust, uh, we are going to be able to see maybe next year or later. What we know so far is that eight in 10 Brazilians don't agree with what happened in January 8th. So 84% uh, are against uh, the acts uh, that occurred in Brasilia uh, two, two weeks ago. So we have this polarized society, but now we have this data showing that the majority of Brazilians are against what happened. So, so we'll have to see how the polarization, but still the being against this kind of uh, violence is going to evolve, right? We'll be looking at that <laughs> together with yeah. you. Thank you so much, uh, Priscilla, for sharing, for sharing that. And uh, now from the very real and concrete uh, world, we're going to move into a slightly different dimension with Caitlin, who is going to take us on a tour of what to expect from the metaverse. Over to you, Caitlin. Great, right, thank you so much, Jennifer, and hello, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to define for you um, this, this new paradigm that we have seen enter the stage in full force. Uh, first, I uh, just want to mention that the metaverse, this term has been around since the 1980s, since science fiction author Neil Stevenson uh, used it in his book, Snow Crash. Uh, but in the last 
past year, we have seen a lot of articles pop out saying the metaverse is here, um, here for consumers. Um, it, technically, these devices have been used for industry. Um, having a little delay. There we go. Um, but this last year, uh, and you can see it here with Satya Nadella's quote from the CEO of Microsoft, that it's here and it's not only transforming how we see the world, but how we participate in it from the factory floor to the meeting room. Um, so 2022 really coined the idea that the metaverse as a concept is for everyone and it's going to touch um, our, all of our lives in different ways uh, globally as well. But before we uh, really unpack that, let's take a moment to think about the definition of, of the metaverse because in our global advisory study that uh, covered this topic area, uh, we found that the understanding of what the metaverse is, um, is not as clear as, as we think. So although a lot of people are aware of the metaverse more so than they were before, um, now 58% globally uh, are aware of the term, uh, only 19% of those people uh, can define this term. And that's partly because the metaverse isn't here, it's tomorrow's internet. So the idea of the metaverse is with us in different types of technology that have gained traction and have really hit the stage over the years. Um, but in its full glory, uh, it will take more time. <laughs> Essentially, that's because it's an ecosystem. So all of these components that are separated on the slide here, in addition to others, must be seamlessly connected to com connect our physical and virtual worlds. Um, but we're not quite at that seamless stage. So to give you an idea of what that will look like, um, I'm just gonna uh, do a, a short illustration of what this might feel like for you as a, as a consumer. So let's imagine that it's 2033. Suddenly you have smart eye contacts that you can wear. Um, and as you're walking around your day-to-day -day life, you can access information from from your eyes and from your voice assistant rather than pulling out a phone or pulling out a laptop. If you're in a new place and you are getting a little bit chilly, want to grab a, a warmer sweater, you can ask your digital assistant to pull up the nearest store to you and that will show up in your, in your vision right, right in front of you in the real world. So the virtual is being overlaid into your physical world. Uh, more so than that, um, the geolocation and the context of where you are will automatically be considered. So now you can be uh, given or sent a car uh, from anywhere you are with a very quick, uh, yes, taxi, please. You can also, once you walk into the store, have your technology that you're wearing on your person connect with the storefront itself so that you're not only uh, giving op given options to try things on um, physically, but you can also do virtual try-ons um, in case you're in a rush, or you can view your digital closet um, through your augmented reality contacts so that if you aren't sure if the sweater will match what you have at home, you can easily pull that information up so you can compare while you're there. Um, and this could even connect to something like a digital wallet or cryptocurrency where you can um, easily and seamlessly and securely pay for that item, even without talking to anyone at all, just picking it up and, and leaving. So this is a pretty ideal vision um, and we're not quite there yet. So the discussion about how this might really show up in the real world is, is still underway. But what we can see now is the different types of technology that have really penetrated different parts of the world and have been picked up by the industries and consumer. This technology provides a link for us to access this newfound digital space and information, so the com combination of physical and digital from anywhere, wherever we are. It may be through augmented reality, such as IKEA Place, maybe through mixed reality, 
um, such as wearing a, a HoloLens headset um, while you are preparing and training your students for uh, a surgery procedure. Or it may be through virtual reality where you are meeting with others from around the world, perhaps for work or to, to meet and play a game with, with a friend. So as I mentioned, we have more familiarity with the metaverse and 52% are familiar with it. Um, and 50% even have positive feelings about engaging with extended reality in their daily life. And when I say globally, I do mean 29 countries that were surveyed. So um, it, it's only global to, to a point at this point. But even though we're seeing this um, interest and acceptance from roughly half of this sample, that means that there's another big chunk that is maybe less certain about it. So we're really seeing um, some split ideas about how familiar and comfortable people are with this new paradigm. As we see sometimes with other new technology, the familiarity and favorability towards metaverse and XR is, is not so different from others, where it's higher among younger adults than in other demographics. A lot of the younger adults that were surveyed, 58% uh, in fact, under 35, are, were very or somewhat positive about the prospect of engaging with AR or VR in different aspects of their life. And in fact, more young adults are also um, interested in and comfortable with having more of their life in a video game setting or even having their identity as part of their digital presence. When we look broadly at the data as well from this survey, half or more believe that the metaverse and XR technology will be substantial and it will impact and affect many different areas. Uh, it can affect virtual learning, entertainment, work, gaming, socialization, as well as travel and tourism and, and training. And in fact, uh, while the public is seeing the possibility for the growth here. Um, this has already been happening and companies who are creating hardware and software um, in these spaces have already begun to release and people have already started to use these to test them out. So we see this in virtual learning in the classroom with augmented reality and mixed reality. We see enhanced gaming opportunities for a more immersive experience. Uh, now the opportunity for people to attend VR events, um, watching football from your or soccer from your living room with a headset on, going to parties, uh, collaborating with colleagues at work from across the globe, a new way to train and work in your industry, as well as socializing with others, improving your fitness, and more. Although there's all these opportunities and new growth areas in this space, uh, we're going to still see that not everyone is going to be all in right away. And it's possible that like in other technologies we use, uh, the metaverse and extended reality won't be uh, fully persistent for, for everyone at all times. Um, but to give you an idea, uh, Seoul recently has committed to the idea of building out a metaverse. So a metaverse soul or a city where their citizens can interact um, with a virtual version of city services and administrative assistance, um, perhaps for businesses, as well as helping with things like checking on citizenship status and getting assistance with documents. We're also going to see that this technology and, and this space will be persistent in specific areas. So um, healthcare, for example. Um, recently, we had uh, Magic Leap uh, gain uh, some authorization to work in more medical capacities. And we're continuing to see other services and technology connect together to help train surgeons in, in the medical space. So, Globally and also individually, we're going to see um, some adoption where people want to use it for multiple places and people may also want to only use it 
for, for a one time to try out a new training scenario. And uh, that's kind of what we're seeing as we're going into 2023. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Jennifer. Thank you, Caitlin. Very fascinating to think all the transformations and the impact on so many different areas of business and uh, work and uh, activity in general. How about our business? How about market research? Are we going to be doing are we going to be doing research differently in the future? I think we will see uh, more applications to do uh, research in a new way uh, in our sector as well. In fact, we've already seen some interest. Uh, for specific types of studies, and it's given us a, a new avenue to, to understand what is um, what's sparking people's interest these days when they're online in these immersive spaces. Great. So lots more to come, I'm sure, in the coming months. So uh, thank you so much for that. And I'm wondering, Simon, if you have been looking at the chat box and if you have seen have. questions popping up. <laughs> Yes, I have through, through traditional technology, uh, or maybe obsolete technology in 10 years' time, uh, perhaps, Caitlin. But it actually picks up on the, the last question that Jennifer asked you, because um, we've got another research question, which is about our own research. Um, do, do we do you have any um, numbers that you can share with us on how many people are actually using some of these metaverse-type uh, devices so far, which are most popular? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so my team does more qualitative and mixed method research, so I'm going to have to like kind of go back to the, the survey data on that one. But um, and I only know the, the market of the US mainly, but um, it's definitely a higher percentage than, than we would expect. Um, I think it's about one in five um, have had access to or have used um, these headsets now in, in the home. Um, the, the one that's top of the market at the moment is the Quest in the US, um, but with the introduction of a lot of new types of headsets, especially this year, um, we're going to see some diversification, um, at least in the ways of, of the workplace, since a lot of the recent releases have been very productivity focused and for industry and business. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think one of the one of the things I was struck by and you're also just building on that was um you mentioned that the sort of getting up to a quarter in some cases and um I think I was quite surprised by over half at least in some markets are are, are expressing at least some level of awareness of what this is yes. this may be about even as you say it's a kind of definitely a journey and, and a, a very much a work in progress. Um talking of journeys Carl um your tech and social media data has been spotted. Um, uh, uh, can you tell us a bit about why they seem to have such differing metrics? Well, we spotted about three years ago that that consumers were increasingly judging the two sectors according to a different set of criteria. So we started measuring social media separately from technology, even though it does fall under the technology bucket. I mean, it it really boils down to, to to one thing, and it's the it's the drivers of trust which are most associated with each of the two sectors. For technology, their area, the the, te the tech sector, their area of strength now is largely the same the same, same as it was ten years ago. They're good at what they do, and they're well led, which are both you new. Know, good strong positive metrics social media unfortunately is is most closely associated with the metric that they would take advantage of of, of me the user um, and this is because there is this perception that they are harvesting data they are manipulating your search they, they are manipulating your kind of your your curated video stream etc that they're simply not trusted to be on your side in quite the same way that the the, the more conventional technology companies are and that's and that that and that is and that followed through all of their all of their measurements, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, to to pick up on that because I think that one of the other takeaways of, of the study is the, the different sectors uh, that that we can all delve into. And uh, Priscilla, um, your energy results in Brazil have also been um, uh, spotted as perhaps something quite um, perhaps different from some of the global figures because I think the energy sector in Brazil was performing pretty well compared with 
the global average and sometimes it may not be the most popular part of the economy but it, in Brazil doing a little bit better can you tell us a little bit more about that sure sure when we look at the drivers for the energy sector we see that uh, these uh, two factors the car said like it's, it's well led and being good at what it does it's high to the energy sector in Brazil but I want to stress that uh, the sector in the country has a kind of um, in, in sustainability badge or sustainability certificate because uh, the energy, 85% uh, of the energy in Brazil is renewable. So the sector is uh, pretty much connected to this idea of sustainability in its essence. Okay, so, so again, a reminder of, of how we need to you know, ground ourselves in the context of actually the, the how it's seen in the particular uh, market that you're operating because it is i think that's one when when we look at the results in more detail it's quite a bit of variation on on that particular um industry okay um oh carl we've got one just popped up for you uh, we're going to come to back to um Luda in a moment for the I think for the last word but uh carl um what's happening in the um the banking and finance sector have you got anything to say about that i think we're uh we're, we're conscious that uh you know, interest rates have been rising in many countries and it's been quite a turbulent time. What are you seeing in, in, in the financial services area? Actual, actually remarkable stability. Right. Um, banking, banking especially, is, 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 is an industry which is, which is defined very, very strongly by, by their competence. Um, is, is ultimately ultimately in the way people kind of assess trust. It's it's kind of like are, are the, is the organisation and the sector that I'm dealing with going to perform according to my expectations? And when it comes to the kind of the core competency of a bank, as in they keep your money safe, and it's there when you want it. And it's so a, a lot of the, a lot of the day to day judgments by consumers on about banks are are at that very functional level rather than the kind of the macroeconomic one. So bank, banking at the moment is is okay. I think if the economy tanks to the level of sort of 2009, then banking will suffer in the same way they did in 2009. But right now, they're all right. Okay. Well, and actually, that perhaps was shown in your um, uh, uh, criteria for judging companies, because I think uh, to pick up on that, uh, banks aren't messing things up. And I think that that was in your top list, wasn't it, about doing what you say you're supposed to do and being reliable. So, okay. So, <laughs> one to watch as we see uh, see how what happens in the next year. Um, and talking of the next year, of course, the theme of our um, webinar, of course, and um, you know, Luda, we're so grateful for you to be able to share with us those perspectives on the ground as we as we look ahead. And uh, we have had a question about the research methods that you've been using to, to understand uh, what is happening on, on the ground. And in particular, the behaviour based uh, uh, tools that you're doing in terms of where people are and how they're moving around and those kinds of things. Do you, if you have a crystal ball, you, you can... Do you expect to be doing more of this kind of behaviour-based uh, research during the period ahead to complement the more traditional survey methods? What's your expectations of uh, of how the way we seek to understand crises and reactions to crises is going to evolve? I think we would see a little bit more um, need for experts in GIS systems, right? So we use it very heavily in our work just because you cannot, this is a very quick way to get the data. You, you're you not always there on the ground, whether it's too difficult, whether you cannot get on there. So I think that we will be using in our in our industry and especially crisis and, and war zones that we will be using more and more of the specialists who have geospatial background. And, and that is something that provides you additional point of view on top of the traditional data. And that's so valuable. Yeah. And even in the US, even even without without crisis or anything, we are doing a big study, uh, for example, on transportation routes for yeah. for residents of different cities. So for city planning purposes, it's very important to understand what the flow of traffic is and where the main roads should be. So GS again is very important to understand how people move and how transport moves. So I think there is there is more and more of that the need of sure. GS systems and specialists. So, so more from drones, more from phones, and more from satellites. Okay, okay yes. well, thank you for thank you. That we really covered a whole range of research methods, uh, and that's coming up in the questions that that, that we're getting. But uh, uh, for now, I must hand back to Jennifer to say a few final words on on today's session.
Great, thank you so much uh, to all our speakers for bringing their expertise and their experience from around the world. And thank you very much to all the people who have been listening to us today. We do hope to see you again uh, in a month's time on the 23rd of February, when we're going to be talking about great expectations of consumers and citizens. And uh, with that, I will say goodbye to everyone and best wishes. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.